so today on 52 Weeks of Why, I'm really happy to have uh, a local of the Mahoning Valley with me uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the challenges that we face here in the Mahoning Valley um, and, and her mission to help people, especially younger people, with their future and their goals here in the Mahoning Valley. Um, but before I move ahead with introducing her, I have a quick quote um, that I just want to share because this one jumped out at me. We were talking a little bit before we started about uh, Inky Johnson. Um, if you don't know Inky Johnson, great motivational speaker. Um, and this quote's from Inky, and it says, How we view what we do will always impact how we do what we do. And Inky's all about perspective, right? His perspective has a lot to do with um, his personal injury and what he has overcome and how he wants to share with other people how they also can overcome. I, I don't want to degrade Inky by summarizing him. You got to look him up if you don't know who he is. Um, but my guest today is Stephanie Gilchrist. It's a real pleasure to have Stephanie here. She is um, very much up my alley in terms of volunteer work, uh, serving the community, and helping kids, especially young adults, realize how they can impact their future. Um, Stephanie, thanks for taking the time to be here today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Wim, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. Um, it's always a good feeling when you could talk about your why. So thank you for having me. No problem. So I'm going to summarize a little bit about Stephanie's history and past. I'm going to let her talk a lot about um, her career progression to where she is now. But uh, as with everyone else, we always start with family. Um, so she's been married for 28 years, has two boys and a grandchild that just turned three years old. Um, and her youngest boy is 14. Um, and we'll get into some of the challenges that she has with raising that teenager as we work our way through. Um, mm -hmm. When I asked Stephanie if she was grandma, she laughed and, and said, no, nope, grandma makes you old. And, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> and I, she said, I don't know, don't put that age on me yet. Uh, so she's Gigi officially. Uh, and I love that my, my mom and, and my wife's mom is Nana. Um, my mom's grandma, but mom is 80 this year. Um, so she, she's accepted her tenure <laughs> as being grandma now. Um, but Stephanie, so I want to talk a little bit about your progression um, with the business incubator and then moving into women in entrepreneurship um, and then ending up here at Inspiring Minds while still working a little bit with um, the business incubator. Uh, so take us back to that 2013-2014 um, year when you began at YBI and uh, what got you interested in working with them? Absolutely. So YBI came at a perfect time. Everything happens for a reason. So it just so happened that uh, I worked for Verizon Wireless for seven years and there was a call center behind the old Hobby Lobby on 224 and they shut us down. And you either had to move or take a payment and sever ties. So, um, of course, my husband and I have a small business here in Youngstown. Um, and we've been on the South Side for over 20 years. So, for us, it was just like, okay, I'm going to just sever ties with you. It's been real. Now what? You know, that was a great job and you get stuck. But I knew that that was something higher working through me and through that whole closing so it was just something everybody else was panicking and i just sat there like calm like nope i know that i'm getting ready to go into another season of my life i just got to figure it out um and as you stated we have a 14 year old son who's autistic so i thought this is the time i could just be home with him and just really give him my full attention i came at peace with that and then i got a call from barb ewing ceo of the young son business incubator and it's funny because she interviewed me almost a year prior to that, but certain funding things didn't happen. I didn't get the job because I knew Verizon was closing. And I was trying to work it out in my time. So I'm like, okay, I'll go back. So she calls me and she's like, I, I know you probably don't want to hear from me because we didn't hire you, but can you come in because we could really use you? And I said, okay, I'll come in. So I came in on a Friday 
I'll never forget it. It was a Friday in August of 2014 because it was a lot going on in my life at the time. And needless to say, I started that Monday because she was just like, I remember you at Wash, you had this experience with Wash, as an intern with economic development, da 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 da. And I just need you to come in. We're getting ready to do this huge project. And she's like, can you do this project for us? And I'm like, um, yeah, sure. Like, I'll figure it out. I'm a smart girl. I can figure this out. Um, scared, terrified, come in. Needless to say, it was a $5.7 million EDA project that was just, um, is now called Tech Block Building 5. We bought the old Vindicator building. Um, and we had, we went on ahead and did the renovations on that. Um, and as we get ready to go into the fun part, which was the whole construction, you know, I worked all the time behind the scenes and, you know, it's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. And I'm like, oh, we get to build the house now. And then they came to me like, we have this vision, but we want you to take it. And I'm like, well, what's the vision? They're like, well, you know, we know you're so passionate and you're so good with like women and our clients, you're sensitive. Everybody sit down in your office, walk away with tissue because they're crying. And it's like, we know our purpose and we know our why. Um, so they're like, can you take this and just, and I was like, uh, let me think about it. But I already knew deep down I got so excited, like my, I have butterflies. And so one of my girls always says, fear and excitement have the same feeling because you get butterflies in your stomach. So you have to make sure you differentiate the two um, and use your wisdom. So I said, okay, what am I going to do? So anyway, I thought about it over the weekend, came back like, all right, I'm in. I got it. Um, they had everything set up like, Heidi's going to do the building. We already talked to her. This one already said they're going to take this off your plate. So you don't even have to worry about this anymore. All you have to do is the WE program. So we birthed the Women in Entrepreneurship program, and we were a little nervous, uh, but we put a call out like to all the women, a lot of business women in community, powerful women, and said, hey, is this a good idea? And the response was so overwhelming. They were like, yes, 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 yes. Um, so we kicked it off with Community Foundation, did a big, huge fundraising event to start the program, the funding for the program. Um, and here we are in 2020 and that was in 2016 that we started that but 2024 years later the we program is still going um but while i was there uh at, at the we program I, I just thought about like my gosh sitting and talking to women i said whoo if i could have got to you as a kid because what i determined about a lot of women and a lot of people we carry stuff from our youth over to our adulthood, which impacts and puts up barriers. Like, I can't do it. And that's taught, that fear, I can't do it. Some I've said, who told you you weren't good enough to do this? And we would dig deep and they'll be like, well, my ex-husband, or I was abused and this happened. So I started pulling that out and I said, oh my gosh, I need the young girls in our community. So I reached out to um, the Inspire Minds Warren crew and that is the corporate office and started working with the young girls with entrepreneurship. And I fell in love with that too. And I was like, oh my Lord, I, I'm loving this whole vibe of youth entrepreneurship, women entrepreneurship. So combining the two loves was, was a beautiful thing for me. Um, and I keep talking about it. So I don't know if you want to ask me a question. Or no, I think like this, you hit on something that I'm reading right now. It's a yeah. book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and in the book Blink, he talks about um, decisions that we make in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. And those decisions that we make in the blink of an eye, we may think that there's not a lot going on behind those decisions we're making. Mm -hmm. But the premise of the book with hundreds of examples as you go through the chapters is, all of those decisions you're making in the blink of an eye are as a result of things that happened to you mm -hmm. when you were young. Yeah. Things that you were told, things that you did and failed at, things that impacted you. And so those decisions that you're making in the blink of an eye um, are not as effective as you think they are. Mm -hmm. and, and the purpose of the book is to try to help you understand and teach you to not just accept that decision that you've made in the blink of an eye, but instead realize when you're doing it, stop and call into question, well, why do I feel this way? Why am I arriving at this conclusion? Um, and it's really cool that you, without even 
having studied this or read this or gone to school for this while you were working with women in entrepreneurship realized if I could just get to them a little bit younger, mm -hmm. it would, all these impressions that they have now that they're grown wouldn't be so firmly set in their mind. I could get them while they're more impressionable and change the way they think before they get to this point. Um, but, I want to get to the why, but I have to ask this. So was there a was there a catalyst in that women in entrepreneurship piece where where the light bulb went on? Or was it just a progression over time where every woman that you interacted with that was an entrepreneur, you had the same thought, if I could only uh, impact women when they're younger? I It was as time went on. You know, you sit there and you hear enough of the same story. Different plots, but same ending. And so for me, it was just like, um, okay, I'm seeing a pattern. Um, you know, it's a different book title, but the pattern was there. So it was over time that I just encountering the multiple women that I have um, within that time frame, it, it just showed me that this was something that had to, to be addressed sooner than later. Yeah, I think that it's... Um a lot of these things are, are systemic, right? They, you have to go back to the core to create real institutional change, uh, whether it's about the way that you think of sports or the way you think of yourself or the way right. you think being a dad is or being a mom is. All of those things are influenced mm -hmm. by something that happened before you could even control your reaction to it, before you could even think about it, these yeah. thoughts are instilled in your head. Um, and that's a new, it's a relatively new thing that I've been reading and studying on because I'm slowly learning um, that, that I, I'll just say it the way I, I think it, that I messed up, right? I messed up. Like the way I think is all wrong. And the way I react, is all wrong and right. i'm slowly going back and trying to correct this stuff that i'm realizing as i go through it okay maybe i shouldn't react that way or maybe i shouldn't say things like that um and and it, it has to do with the person that i want to be right i have the vision of this person i want to be mm -hmm. and in order to get to that person i got to go back and wreck some things mm -hmm. um that are preventing me from getting there right Right. Um, so um, came, coming out of that now, getting into um, Inspiring Minds, right, which is uh, where you are now, um, tell us about the age groups that you're helping there um, and how coming out of YBI and Women in Entrepreneurship into this, um, that transition and how it is now. Yeah, for sure. So coming in, it was a very tough decision because I felt like I was torn between two loves um, because I loved I love helping people, period. But helping women was very powerful for me. And then helping youth, younger folks was like, oh my gosh, I love both of them. How do I do this? Um, so making the decision to become full-time and, and become executive director at Inspire Minds of Youngstown was a challenge. But at the same time, it just took me to really um, pray about it and say, well, who needs me the most? And that's how I had to answer that question. Like who needs me, where could I do more impact? And of course it was coming with the youth. So 2017, I came here and, and began the work with the youth um, and have, have seen some great things happening. Um, I've, I've witnessed some of our youth come out of their shells where they wouldn't even say a word to us. And now they come in and they're they're affectionate, they are, their personality has developed. Um, they're working and that's a shock to a lot of people. Like they're teenagers who have jobs and they wouldn't even talk to people, but now you're working in customer service jobs at fast food restaurants. Um, so it's just so much that reward for it. We have a student that just sold t-shirts. I mean, there's just so much reward when you can see the transition and working with our youth. And I feel like now I'm impacting them, but then some of the mothers um, are entrepreneurial as well. So now I get to get a chance to do both. I love that because now you can take your your other love that yep. that you didn't really put on the back burner, but you just set it aside for a minute so that you can help the youth. And in the midst of doing that, there's moms who are entrepreneurs that you can share that other love with. How cool! Um, I love it. Okay, 
So Stephanie, I'd love for you to share with us your why. So my why, um, I will tell you this, ironically, when I graduated from YSU with my undergrad in 2005, I was 30 years old and I hated going to school sometimes. I was always the oldest one in the class. I had to show my license because they wouldn't believe me. But I wrote something and I had to look at it and say, oh my gosh. And it was my reason, my mission in my life. It was a professional development class. I don't know if why she still offers it. And you had to take it. I think it was your senior year. And you had to do a whole portfolio. And the beginning had to have your mission statement for life. And so I keep all of that stuff. So one day I'm cleaning up and I'm like, oh, let me look at this just to see what it says. And my mission and my why was to see every woman and youth in our community be successful and to help them make their dreams come true and how I was going to do it. Isn't that crazy? In 2005, that was my mission and my vision then. Then I had to go back and think about growing up as a youth. And then I had a girl work for me who said, you never knew it, but I used to look up you to you growing up in school and at church, you were like my mentor. And I was like, what? Um, and then I had another girl say that to me. I'm like, really? And I had to think about my involvement with youth, even in church as a young person, um, leading certain meetings and bringing them together, um, youth groups and things of that nature. So for me, my why was so evident and clear just because I get up every day excited about what's getting ready to happen for other people around me. Not so much my life, but the lives of those that I get a chance to impact. So I know that my why and my purpose is to see other people become 100% of what they were created to do. That is why I exist. I exist for no other reason. If I can't, if I, if when I die, if they can't stand over my casket and that dash between 1975, my year and the year that I am gone, if I need people to say between that dash, I need, I need them to say, and I said it in, in a speech, acceptance speech one time, I need to hear me too, me too, me too. Like she changed my life, me too, me too. I was this and now look, yep, me too. Um, for me, that is just more important than material things. You know, people offer it all the time, you know, oh, um, you know, there's this job. Do you, you know, it pays this much and, and the money sounds good, but I'm like, but it doesn't serve my why. So I'm not going to do it. It's so interesting to me that um, your why coming out in 2005 and and literally articulating it the way that you did then is still exactly the same today the way that you articulate it um do you think that that growing up i mean if we go back to 12 year old stephanie uh -huh. um at that point in your life were you still focused on um, the improvement of the life of your classmates and your friends, um, or or was it different back then? Or if you look back, can you see it still present in you then? Yeah, I think looking back, it was there, you know. Um, and and when you're younger, again, like you said, stuff doesn't hit you till you're older. That aha, <laughs> like um, so for me, even a young lady, um, a friend of ours that we all grew up with, moved to town when we were young in school and she did a big post one time on Facebook and she tagged me in it because she was like, you were one of the ones that impacted my life. Like when I moved here, when I was an like outcast, you, you just made me feel like I was at home. Like you always were just that person. I'm like, who me? And doing, when you do your why, you don't even know that you're operating in that why because it's so much a part of your nature. You know, that's where that debate of is leadership born or are leaders born or created? You know, you always get that popular question of are you born or created? And I always say it's a mixture of both. But I think it's that character and, and that personality that just that just I have that heart for people, you know, that I just love people. And I want to see people do well and do good, especially women and children, because I was raised by a single mom. And I think that triggered it as well. She worked very hard.
And so um, definitely I say it, it triggers back like, oh, that did happen when, in my youth. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of other people that I've had the privilege of interviewing who could go back to very specific times in their life when they were 13, 14, 15, or whatever it was, and they could remember an instance where they went out of their way to help someone. Yeah. Um, and that is stuck in their memory because it, it fulfills their why, right? It mm -hmm. continues to have them with fulfillment and have them understand that that was their why even back then. Maybe back then you didn't know. Maybe back then you didn't articulate it, but you were living it just like yeah. you said, you were living it before you knew it. Um, if you go back to that period of time in your life, um, you know, something that we've talked about a lot over the, the 25 or 26 interviews I've done is this concept of a person that creates the fork in the road mm -hmm. that um, a lot of times people, especially young adults, um, feel like there's only one path. And, and somebody ultimately comes along and shows them another way or shows them all the ways that are open and available to them. Um, did you have that person that, that came forth to you when you were growing up or even later in life that served you, that instilled in this, in you that I want to be like that person? Mm. I would say growing up, I grew up in a ministry where excellence was always the key word. It was always the buzzword. Everything you do, do it excellence. Do it with greatness. Um, and I would say that um, at that time, um, his name was Bishop Norman L. Wagner. And I, I definitely looked to him. Um, and there were, there were some prominent people such as uh, Lynn Phillips who um, owns uh, Ellie Black Phillips um, he, Funeral Home. Um, she was another one that I just saw them and everything they did, they did with excellence. And so growing up, you do pinpoint those folks who impact your life. Um, I was surrounded around, I tell you, some great influential people that just, just made that happen for me from family to the folks I just named that didn't know I was watching per se, but um, absolutely was an influence to help me see. But I, I would definitely say that my, my pastor at the time was a huge influencer and, and was a great person to look at, especially um, when it came to decisions and understanding how to make those decisions wisely. Um, so yeah, definitely I would attribute it to him for sure. And do you, I mean, so now as you're having an impact on the lives of these young adults, mm -hmm. um, does it occur to you that you're filling those shoes? Absolutely. I def I say it all the time. He passed away in 2010. Um, and it was a devastation to the, the, a lot of us in this community, we were devastated. Um, but the vision that he had, um, he, his vision for youth. He had a youth pro uh, football. He had a school that I attended um, from pre-K on. So the whole community, the way that we were raised, we were surrounded by a great source of wealth and knowledge and community. Um, and that's the same thing I want for our kids. And so for me, yes, it's crazy because even right now I have this vision and I had to tell someone, I'm like, okay, I think I think I'm living, I think I'm trying to live his dream. Like what he dreamed, I'm trying to really make it happen. And it's, it's starting to scare me because I'm starting to get this push to make some stuff happen. Um, and I definitely will say now I see that what was instilled in me now, I'm instilling in my kids. Yeah, I think that uh, the legacy component for, especially for those who are leading a congregation Mm -hmm. um, they're always instilling in everyone who listens to them and everyone who believes like they do this idea of, of legacy and this idea that um, someday the baton's going to be passed to you. Right. And 
what are you going to do with it when it's handed to you, right? What are you, are you going to, are you going to run with the legacy? What were, I, I, I hear your brain talking. What were you going to say? Was, I was going to share with you that I, I did have, I had a couple students. And so recently, um, so I struggled with type two diabetes. And so uh, I wasn't doing too well in like July. I wasn't doing good. And we were in the middle of summer and my kids could kind of see it. So I came in one day and I wasn't feeling good. So I come in, they had this big card waiting for me. So we had a whole discussion. I said, now listen, y'all, I'm okay. I'm gonna live. I said, but if I die, y'all still got to do ABC. And they went in, they were like, die, you you still got work to do. Like you can't leave us. Like we, you, you're mentoring us, you're helping us, you're molding us. And they went into this whole panic mode and I just got tickled. But I also, my heart was warmed because I heard them say, we're following you and we're not ready to stop following. We're not ready to leave just yet. Um, I have one that's like, I want to be the CEO. I'm like, CEO of what? I don't know. I'm like, so you don't know? So I had, she, this week she said, you told me to go research some stuff on CEOs, what they do. And she's like, here it is. And this is what I think I want to do now. Da, da, da. So I see the development happening with the kids and um so that legacy piece we are so important on generational wealth we're getting ready to do stocks and bonds with them because we're i, I asked them a question i was like how many of you guys can go to your parents and ask them for this much money and they were like no i like your grandparents they were like no i was like so guess what you'll be that generation to change that and so we are about legacy and and teaching them about what generational not just you but generational yeah, this, um, you and I were talking before we started about Jim Rohn, one of my mentors, and you mentioned uh, Les Brown, uh, another one of my mentors that I've never met. And Jim Rohn um, has, has a quote that I think I'm going to say it right. It, it says that what you have so far is what you've attracted by the person you've become. Mm -hmm. And if you change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change what's on the outside. You only have to change what's on the inside. And don't wish it were easier, wish that you were better, right? And I think um, for me, when he says that, I, again, I'm, I'm maybe on this personal development kick, uh, but <laughs> when he says that, it's like, okay, I get it. I've always wanted to blame everything else. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's the economy, it's the government, it's the, it's the wrong season, it's, it's rates it's the stock market it's whatever it is it was it was never me if i i had a whole list of things that i could blame uh until there was nothing left to blame yeah and i think maybe that's when i realized oh maybe it's not everything right. else maybe it's me maybe i need to be the one that changes right <laughs> um and having these people you in their lives to help them understand that without having to hit rock bottom they don't have to get to a point where their blame list is two pages long to realize hey maybe i can work on this myself because they've got you to help them create that that fork or, or change their mindset on what they're doing now uh, so is there a point your why is is um, centered around others right it's centered around helping others is there a point for you where you feel that your why is fulfilled, where it's done? I would say my, your why is never to me, it's such a big, bigger than you on um, purpose that it's never done. Your work to me, is just never done. Um, and so for me, I would know, or everyone would know my why, my, my part in the why will be complete the day I no longer live. But as long as I have breath in my body, I'm working on my why. But the day I no longer have that breath in my body, that means my work is complete. It is finished. So I think that's definitely um, a big, huge part of it. Like someone said, uh, and I think it was Les Brown. Les Brown says it, but someone else said it, and I can't remember who it was. But they always say that the, the grave is the wealthiest place because of all the dreams and the visions that are buried with people. 
So for me, I get up every day with a purpose and initiative to do some things because I refuse to die with stuff still buried in me. My husband said it yesterday to me. He's like, you are so big. You're such a busy body. Like, you're just doing too much. He's like, I can't. You're just doing too much. And I was like, that's why you just do what you do and I do what I do because I refuse to... I refuse to sleep on my why, you know, I need to make sure I do everything I do and everything I can do every day to make sure that why is still, um, still that function and people are, are, are seeing manifestation of it. If I could take that a level further, I would mm-hmm. say that your pastor is a living example passed on whose why is continuing even though he's not here that legacy is carried on even though he isn't here to push his why even though you aren't here to push your why you're instilling it in other people and there will be one of your students or one of your women in entrepreneur who take that baton and say you know what stephanie did this and and i loved every minute of what she did and i'm going to take this baton and i'm going to carry it and i'm going to do the same thing um and so I would say, yeah, when, when we pass on, our mission for that why is done. But I, I don't even think the why goes away at that point. I think yeah. that if you live that life, um, it can go on and on and on as long as that legacy and that baton keeps mm-hmm. getting passed on. Um, is, is, there, is there anything we didn't touch on? Are there any final thoughts? I know that you said you've done a little bit of studying in the why. Uh, was there anything in our conversation that you wanted to pull out or anything from Zig's book that you read that you wanted to point out before we finish up? No, I think that just knowing, just understanding your purpose and staying in that lane and operating in it. Um, what, I, what I've learned when you operate in your why, I'm learning the power of the word no to a lot of things. If it doesn't serve the purpose, if it doesn't, increased or impact my why, then I, I'm good at saying no, thank you. Even people in relationships, like they're seasonal. And so you're good for this season in my life and I'm good for this season. And then I'm learning how to cut off and say, thank you. <laughs> On to next, because my why, your why continues to grow. Your why is like anything else. It's like a, a plant. You know, when you get the seed, you water it, it grows and it grows and it grows. And it's like a tree that brings oxygen and life to a place um, and an environment. So I think that your why is definitely all, all of that encompassed is that you just you continue to grow. And sometimes you limit yourself like this is all I'm doing. And <laughs> and that's not that's not your why. Your why is bigger than you. So you have to continue to grow with it. Um, as you grow as a person and personal, like you said, that personal development and all of that, you know, I'm with you. It's like, I'm always trying to increase my personal development and making sure that I can give more to people that I'm around and surrounded. Yeah, Stephanie, thanks so much for sharing that. And I agree. I think that, um, the why not only fills you with purpose, um, but it's also your true north on your compass, right? If, you, if you're at a loft, if you're in a room getting pulled seven different directions with people asking you to do things and volunteer and go do this and help with this, and, and you pull out that compass, right. and it tells you that direction that you're supposed to be going, um, it'll help you not only – uh, be able to say no, but also to say no to them in such a way that they understand, oh, this is, they're going this way mm-hmm. and we're going this direction. And I now understand why we're not going to follow down the same path. Maybe their paths will intercede sometime in the future, right? But Absolutely. right then it's not the time. Thanks so much for everything that you do for our community and for women in entrepreneurship and for the youth, especially in Youngstown. Um, I know there are lots of challenges that you face and in helping them overcome their mental obstacles of who they can be and what they can be and 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 in the midst of 
raising a 14 year old nonverbal autistic child. Um, man, I, I, I think you're wonderful. Thanks for all the hard work you. you do. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me.